special show tonight. Gonna have a dialogue for greater understanding. Not a debate, conversation, and the goal is everybody understands each other better at the end of the night. So I'm gonna learn something, you're gonna learn something, we're all gonna learn something. So stick around, we'll learn something together here on Street Apologist Radio. This is the program, well, Street Apologist Live, sometimes I still call it radio. Program where we serve the underserved and look into the overlooked. My name is Vocab, Christian Apologist, Urban Apologist, all that kind of stuff. Hit the thumbs up, hit that like button, whichever place you're watching, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. And share this link, please, because people are going to enjoy this. We'll do about an hour and a half tonight or so. Got Father Jonathan Ivanov, all the way from New York. And we got Dr. Bob in the house. We're just going to have a good old conversation of a couple Protestant, Reformed, Baptistic types talking to an Eastern Orthodox gentleman. And uh, we'll have some fun. We'll have some fun. Are you guys ready? If you're ready, then let's go. Looking spiffy because I'm gonna impress Jonathan Ivanov because he's a serious man with serious letters behind his name. <laughs> no, he's a cool guy though too, and uh, and I, he seems to be in very good health. But if he's not, it's okay because we'll just have Dr. Bob take care of him. Those are the two guests tonight, so let me bring them on right now. You'll only be able to see one of their pretty faces though, and uh, the other guy you're just gonna have to imagine. Welcome to Street Apologist Live, Father Jonathan Ivanov. All right, yeah, give it up for yourself. That works. <laughs> and let me make sure that everyone can hear Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob, I'm trying to make sure you're not muted. Are you unmuted on your end? How are you doing? No? Yeah? Okay, let me, um, let me do this. Okay. There we go. There we go. There. You are here, my friend. Okay. So, the three of us are going to have a good old-fashioned conversation, and we do not claim to agree or to agree with everything by the end of the night or anything like that, but we, at the same time, believe that we can uh, have a good discussion, and I'm, I'm excited about that discussion that we're going to have tonight. And so uh, we got a list of questions here that we're going to uh, – don't worry, I'm messing around with the camera stuff. I'll get it right. Just just give it some time. I'll get it right. I'll get it right. We got a list of questions here that uh, Jonathan Ivanov has already seen, so he knows what we're going to ask. He also knows there's going to be, uh, like, follow-up questions. And so we've talked about this, and uh, specifically uh, uh, Dr. Bob and, 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 and Jonathan Ivanov, they've had a beautiful two-hour conversation behind the scenes and all that. And so while we're all getting set up and everyone's coming in, Jonathan Ivanov, would you be able to tell the audience a little bit about yourself if they are not familiar with the bio? And then, like I said, I'm sure we'll all learn something. Go ahead, my friend. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I'm a resident here on Long Island, New York, and I'm, I'm originally from California, originally grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, so, uh, other than the difference of time vocab, we, we were almost neighbors for a while there. Mm-hmm. Um, went to seminary in the mid '80s, got married, and started having kids in the in the late '80s. And um, uh, I've been the um, I've been in ordained ministry with my diaconate, and my priesthood, now for for 30 years, and coming up on 29 years in April as a priest. Been at the same parish for almost 29 years, a parish called Saint John the Theologian here on Long Island, and I. Um, I got I get asked this question a lot lately. Why apologetics? How did you get interested in it? You know, I take very seriously what St. Paul says about having an answer for the hope that is within us, but not just having an answer, having a way of dialoguing with anybody who has a question and to discuss with them how we as Orthodox Christians look at our faith, feel about our faith, and uh, would very much like to share the faith. And this is a great opportunity. So again, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to come on your show and to um, uh, to talk about this faith that means so much to me and, and uh, probably is of curiosity to, to at least some that are going to be watching the show tonight. Yes, yes, indeed. And we've been on before, uh, and I think we had a really good conversation. And uh, 
I'm glad to have you on again and all that. Um, you're on Long Island. I'm curious. So I'm part Sicilian, right? So this is just a curiosity thing. This is not on the list. Are there many Italian American Orthodox? Do you, it seems like in Long Island you would at least have some, maybe. Well, we have more than some. I have many in my parish, as a matter of fact. Really, and uh, I have to say they are some of the the warmest, nicest, most open, generous people that I, that I've ever met. Lovely, lovely people, and uh, it's just a joy to have them in my parish. I'm I'm very blessed to. Um, to have them so um that's terrific i didn't know that about your background now i have know a little bit something more about you the yeah. malone threw me i thought you know that's the irish part of you I yeah guess, no right? i don't have any irish that's that's not a real uh, last name uh that comes oh, from okay. i used to be a a, a a tagger like a graph writer and hmm, i would tag okay. my tag was m-a-l-o-n-e and so i would tag mal one that's how i pronounced it and then when i uh started doing hip hop i i wanted to be vocab but i knew vocab was a, kind of a predictable rap name so i said but if i add my old graffiti name into it but smash it together i'll have like a first and last alias vocab malone i like the way it sounded but i have no irish it's just it's just okay, so, okay. So not, <laughs> yeah so and a lot of my uh as you could imagine uh sicilian family from new york as well B buffalo area are uh, roman catholic uh, somewhat nominal, but somewhat nominal, you know, that goes, but, uh, and we also have Dr. Bob, Dr. Bob, what's going on, brother? Can you, uh, uh, talk to us for a little bit here and give people a little bit about your bio as well? Yeah. So, um, I, I try to keep a, a low profile because I work in academia and, uh, given, uh, the, the nature of cancel culture these days. Uh, and uh, the discussion of the topics that I have on my channel, um, you know, I try I try to play things close to the best. But uh, as far as you know, my bio, um, I'm actually from uh, the Atlanta area. I grew up in uh, the good old uh, Peach State, uh, the state of Georgia, and uh, spent most of my early life there. Um, actually, if you've ever seen the movie Gone with the Wind, uh, it is based upon your life? Uh, yeah. It's based upon my hometown, which is Jonesboro, Georgia. Mm. Uh, oh, wow. Okay. So uh, there's actually an interesting scene where the Confederate Army captain is galloping past Terra, and he's like, the Yankees are cutting off the McDonough Road. And uh, I grew up basically where you could throw a stone and hit McDonough Road. Um, grew up uh, in a Southern Baptist uh, context uh, originally. Uh, actually attended the church that uh, Truett Cathy was a member of. Uh, Chick-fil-A. Yeah, Chick the founder of Chick-fil-A. Uh, I knew him personally. He was a, he was a good and honorable man and uh, certainly lived his life and uh, had his business principles uh, in accord with uh, the, uh, the Christian profession that he held. Um, so I stayed there, uh, stuck around, uh, and got uh, an engineering degree. Uh, at uh, uh, Georgia Tech, so I am a rambling wreck from Georgia Tech. Um, You're using that, a bunch of words I don't understand right now, just so you know. But go yeah. ahead. Yes, so I, I got a degree in uh, in engineering. Uh, thought about potentially going uh, to seminary around that time, but decided against it because I had a love for science and technology as well as medicine uh working in the hospital setting so i ended up down in new orleans uh, for five years where i picked up my md and my uh public health degree and uh now i am in my final year of residency getting ready to take my board exams uh, so if both of you gentlemen could be praying for me in that regard uh that would be good all right all right thank you dr bob and Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Shout out to everybody in the live chat. And we're already getting the gingerbread man saying that Father Jonathan looks based. That's the slang that the kids use these days, brother. <laughs> That's what that is. B based means good. It means like... Oh, it looks good. Well, thank, thank yeah, you, gingerbread yeah. man. I've, I've been told I look so pale I could never be mistaken for a person of color. That's for sure. Based is like... Um, 
it means you're you're down with the authentic raw type of thing. It's 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 it's, it's it, yeah, it's kind of a, you know, it's 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 slang. <laughs> Uh, anyways, okay, so uh, let's let's. I think we got that out of the way. Welcome again to the show. This is a dialogue for understanding between some reform guys and uh, Eastern Orthodox gentlemen, Father Jonathan Ivanov, and uh, we're gonna have a conversation and we'll take some questions uh, at some point here. Don't worry, we'll get you guys in here, and I pray that you enjoy it. And uh, I believe that we will all learn a little something, something. Let's start real basic. What is the Orthodox Church? What is the Orthodox faith? Very, very good question. A lot of people uh, really have no concept of, of what the Orthodox Church is. There's not a lot of us in America, that's for sure. It's probably all told maybe less than a million and a half, if that. So we're not very big. We're not very uh, noticeable in some parts of the, uh, of the country. We are in, in, in some parts, but not in other parts. We're not very well known in the South maybe the West yet. But the Orthodox Church is the New Testament Church, as we like to say. Um, we trace our history all the way back to the New Testament. We, we are the church that answers the question, what happened to the church the apostles left behind? We, we answer the question, what happened to the church after the apostles died? So what they preached and what they taught and what they planted, what happened to those churches in Ephesus and Thessaloniki, in, um, in Athens, in Alexandria, in Jerusalem? You know, what happened to those churches? Where did they go? Um, and, and we are the continuation of those church plants. We are the continuation of the church the apostles left behind. So as such, we would look and sound, if someone were to come to our services today, we would look and sound probably very different than what a lot of people are used to, especially those that come from the Protestant churches. Uh, we, we are a liturgical church. We have liturgy. We are a sacramental church. Um, all of our services are, are sung and chanted. Uh, we have a, the use of incense and icons. So there's, there's that visual aspect that would look very different to people today. But we are the church that follows, as I mentioned earlier, the teachings of the apostles. So what they taught their disciples and what their disciples passed on from generation to generation, we still observe all of that. And we follow that as best we can, and we've remained faithful to it for 2,000 years. So in a nutshell, I would say that's probably an introduction of that um you know it, it's clear to us and we think we can we can make a good case that the orthodox church is a continuation of to this day the church planted by the apostles back in the first century all right thank you thank you thank you um now dr bob the way we're kind of structuring everything is i kind of ask the question i do the the dummy job and then if you want to ask a follow-up question you can and so you you know you see how many questions we have of course you pretty much contributed to them right so yeah. you can decide where you want to ask a follow-up question or not just let me know bro is this a spot or you want to go to number two i think we can go ahead and go to number two because i think it's related to uh what uh father jonathan's response was to part one right and uh so everyone knows, uh, you know, I do uh, polemics and I do debates on the channel, but whenever I have someone on that I don't necessarily agree with on everything, I don't always have to be polemicizing or always debating them. I can just talk to them and listen. So my job tonight is not to stop Father Jonathan every time he says something I don't agree with, right? Because our paradigms are different. So I would have a different paradigm there. So we, would, if this was a different kind of discussion we would say here's our perspective we, maybe we'll get it out at some point don't get me wrong but i just want everyone to understand that and know that so we got to be able to listen to learn so let's continue on what is speaking of paradigms what is the orthodox church's paradigm for church history you know that that's a good question um we really don't have a perspective or or a paradigm on church history what what we what we have is a desire to preserve the worldview of the apostles themselves, the worldview of the body of Christ when it came into existence on Pentecost, and as it has been preserved and carried forward to this day. Um, and to keep that worldview throughout history, even to our own day, we don't try to adopt the worldview of, 
the of um, I don't know the Roman Empire or the Russian Empire or, uh, or or the world today. Our mind is not focused on this world. Our mind is focused on the kingdom. At least we we know that it should be. And to get caught up in the paradigms and in the perspectives of this world is to really, I think, take our eye off the prize and to really become unfocused on the kingdom of which we are citizens and heirs and become a little bit too involved in the kingdoms of this world, uh, which have been antithetical to the gospel from the very beginning. So when you speak of a paradigm of history, I don't know that we actually have one. Some people might say we do. I don't think we do. Um, I think our paradigm is the kingdom of heaven, and we've been trying to keep our eyes focused on that ever since the beginning. All right. What would you say are the seminal events that distinguish the Orthodox Church from other Christian churches from your perspective, from the perspective of the Eastern Orthodox Church? You, like you might mention councils, monasticism, you know, schisms, things along those lines, you know, important dates, 1517, but obviously you can't cover it all. I'm just saying, you know, yeah, what are those, those marks and events? Well, um, <clears throat> I think the, um, the, the, the marks of our church as the body of Christ is that we look at our, our church as a church that is very conciliar, um, where, where bishops from the very beginning have played a key role in the uh, organization of the church, the administration of the church, the keeping of the faith, um, the keeping of the purity of the faith, um, that our church as the church as we like to call ourselves, uh, the church of the seven councils, um, we look at ourselves not as a church structured around one person, such as the Bishop of Rome. We look at ourselves as structured around councils where the bishops coming together under the guidance of the Holy Spirit were able to bring clarity to problems that came up from generation to generation. Um, so the councils are a big distinguishing factor in uh, the Orthodox Church. If you're, if you're looking for distinguishing factors, and I think if I understood your question, that's what you were asking about. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing is that we are a liturgical and a sacramental church, and that those things are not just adornments, but those are things through which God's grace comes to us, comes to the, to, to the Orthodox Christian and draws us closer, not just blesses us like some sort of Santa Claus God sprinkling grace dust down upon us, but um, through liturgy and through the Holy Mysteries, which is what we call the sacraments, we are drawn closer to God, closer in God, and in becoming more godlike, which is the goal really of our life, is to spend our life becoming more godlike through what the church offers in liturgy, in the sacraments, uh, in the readings of the church fathers and the desert fathers, in uh, growing in life and faith and spiritual understanding. Uh, so those are some of the things. There's certainly, like you inferred earlier, uh, there could be a lot of things, but those would be some of the things that are important to us. Thank you, thank you. Uh... I think Dr. Bob left us for a second, but I think now you're back with us. Dr. Bob, is that you? <coughs> Under the channel that says Mary? Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know where he, where he is. All right. Well, then, next, next up, why is the term Eastern often attached to the front uh, Orthodox Church. Oh, a good question, because a lot of people, especially in America today, only know us by the phrase Eastern Orthodox Church. Now, um, <clears throat> that came up uh, really from historians and writers in the West to distinguish the Western Church from the Eastern Church. And it's very similar in a way if I were to use the phrase uh, and ask your 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 uh, listeners, have you heard of the uh, Eastern Roman Empire? A lot of people might say no because they really haven't. It's known better as the Byzantine Empire. But that's an interesting phrase because that phrase, the Byzantine Empire, was only coined in the 19th century. And if you had gone back a thousand years and asked the 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 Eastern Roman, the Eastern Romans, if you had asked them what they were, they would say, well, we're Romans. 
Well, mm -hmm. what's what what's this empire that you're in? What's the Roman Empire? They didn't know themselves as Byzantines, and this, the the similar kind of confusion with terms is all often applied to us. Um, we don't know of ourselves as Eastern Orthodox Christians. We just know our, of our Orthodox Christians. People might have heard of us as Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox or whatever Orthodox, but it's all the same. I like to, and people say, "Well, I don't understand." And I like to say, "Well, if you if you're Roman Catholic or no Roman Catholics, it's like the difference between Italian Catholics and um, Span uh, 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 Spanish Catholics or." Uh, German Catholics or something like that, or German Lutherans and Swedish Lutherans. It's kind of that difference. Most of what is believed is all the same thing. And the other differences that are accounted for are cultural or linguistic or something like that. All right, that works. Bob, Dr. Bob, are you with us? Uh... I am. I don't know why I just sort of went out into the green room, uh, into the ether for a few minutes and uh, just reloaded the page. Okay, okay. Well, I'm glad you're here. Uh follow up so, to that yeah so i wanted to sort of go back to question two uh and maybe offer you know a little bit of a different perspective so one thing that uh father jonathan mentioned at least the claim of the the eastern orthodox church is that it is the church that christ founded and yet and as far as not having a a paradigm of church history well even if we think that the church is this ideal that has been founded by Christ, this institution, it is an institution that still lives and exists within history. Uh, mm -hmm. There are other Christian groups. Uh, I was just in a, a chat last night um, uh, where there was a Church of Christ, so it's like Campbellite representative, discussing with some Reformed guys uh, some differences in theology that they have. And uh, the Church of Christ claims to be the church that Jesus Christ founded. Um, the Oriental Orthodox Church would claim to be the church that Christ founded. The Roman Catholic Church would claim to be the church that Christ founded. So I think that whether or not we, uh, you know, want to put certain labels on things, we all live and exist in history, and the church has lived and existed in history. Uh, there are certain, you know, traditions that have developed uh, through time. You know, the, the creed itself was not something that was native to the earliest period of the church. Um, that uh, there were doctrinal controversies that led to uh, development. Now, that may be a term that I, I think is rejected by the Eastern Orthodox. Uh, they would say that um, it's just a further clarification, but... I think it has to be said that there are clearly historical developments and uh, cultural influences that we all have to wrestle with, that we all have to deal with uh, as we examine our past. Yeah, so we're getting, uh, you know, sort of that's sort of Bob Zemai's perspective. Uh, I don't know, uh, Father Jonathan, if you want to give your perspective on that or go on to the next question. Well, I, I'll just say something real quickly. Dr. Bob is right about one thing. Yes, the church has existed and does exist today in, a, in an historical uh, context, in a cultural context. I mean, uh, uh, to, to people uh, who are outside of orthodoxy, Russian orthodoxy can look very different from Greek orthodoxy. Um, so those, those, th those, there are truths there, Dr. Bob. I do agree with you on some of those points. Not on all of them. I think, obviously, we have a different take on certain things. But on that, I can agree with you. All right, all right, all right. What about this? Uh, why is it Eastern instead of Western? I mean, we kind of answered that. But uh, just when someone it really wants to understand the difference between East and West or maybe Latin and Greek, what would you maybe say is the divide or why is there a, a differentiation at all? Well, the, 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 the differences mean less and less today. When, when the Eastern Orthodox Church, let's say 100 years ago, was confined to Eastern Europe, Russia, and the Levant, you know, you know the Middle East, mm -hmm. uh, that may have been very true, and it may have been a very clear delineation at that time. Today you find Orthodoxy in Japan, in the Philippines, in India, in Africa, in South America. You find it all over. And not just the people that have come from Eastern Europe to, let's say, America, but you have 
in in the Orthodox Church in in America today, you have, uh, my goodness, a, a plethora of people who've come into her from uh, the the uh, from from paganism, from Judaism, Islam, from Protestantism, Evangelicalism, Pentecostalism, whatever. So it's no longer Eastern in the sense of a territorial delineation, although we could speak of Eastern in a more of a cultural way. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a very strong Hellenistic foundation to Orthodoxy, for example. Uh, and I don't say that in a deprecating way. I say that in a positive way. Um, and um, th there's, there's much of Orthodoxy that still has an Eastern flavor to it. Uh, it doesn't take much to walk into an Antiochian Orthodox Church or a Greek Orthodox Church and still see and feel and hear it. Right. Yeah, I, th I think that makes sense. I think it's about right. What would you say, you mentioned the Orthodox in the United States of America. What's sort of the big picture, the bird's eye view of how the Orthodox Church came to America? Sure. In, in the 1700s, in the late 1700s, when Russia... A lot of people don't know this. Russia once owned Alaska. The extent of the Russian Empire was huge. You know, it went from, from what is today Belarus and Kiev all the way out to what is today Alaska, and they had Alaska. They, they could not um, uh, really defend an empire that big. And so in the 1860s, right, right during or after uh, the Civil War, Russia sold Alaska to the United States. But it was in the seven, late Seward's 1700s... Folly. Sorry, I just had to mention Seward's that. Folly, yeah, Seward's Folly, yeah. Seward's Folly. And, the guy that and then they, it, they thought they thought he yeah, made they a horrible mistake. Yeah, then they and it was no longer Seward's Folly. Yeah. <laughs> so in, in, the, in the 1700s, the Russian Orthodox Church got very serious about evangelizing the native people of Alaska, and they sent um, a, a very formal delegation in 1794 uh, to Alaska, a, a group of monks from the Valam, the famous Valam Monastery, uh, to go there and to preach and teach and so forth. And so these monks went there, and uh, some of them were, were, were uh, martyred, uh, but some of them, like uh, St. Herman of Alaska, who lived on Kodiak, uh, Kodiak Island, uh, lived into the 1840s and uh, is known to have baptized over 10,000 native uh, Alaskans. So um, the mission there that went there uh, didn't bring, I mean, these monks were Russian, they weren't anything else. But when they came to Alaska, they spent the time learning the languages and the culture and translating uh, the services and the gospels into the language that people there could understand. Uh, St. Innocent of Alaska, the great um, evangelizer of the Aleuts and, and later metropolitan of Moscow, uh, was a, a, a Renaissance man such as we have never seen on this continent before, other than maybe Thomas Jefferson. Uh, he built buildings, he built clocks, he trans, he, he's the one who invented the, um, I believe I want to say the Aleut uh, alphabet or the Clinket alphabet, one of the two he invented and it's still used today. So they were very uh, sensitive to the culture and languages and customs and traditions of the native people. And um, uh, it, it is said about St. Herman when he lived on Kodiak Island, uh, it was 10 years before he baptized his first person. He first learned the language and he got to know the people and they got to know him. And when it was time and he was able to speak about Christ, he did. But before his death, he baptized 10,000 people. So, And he wasn't even a priest, by the way. Hmm. So well, it started there and it moved down from there uh, beginning in the 1860s. And then it finally came south into San Francisco. And at the same time, then the immigration uh, from Eastern Europe and elsewhere uh, started primarily in the east. But uh, there was a Greek Orthodox Church in New Orleans in 1864 or something like that. Uh, and they started coming in and, and planting themselves in communities and building churches, and the church grew from there, primarily from immigration. So if the United States never would have bought Alaska. <laughs> I'm just teasing. So those are kind of overview questions. Uh, uh, yep. Dr. Bob, before we go to the kind of the deep dive questions, tack on anything, my friend? No, I guess the only commentary I had, sort of the reason I asked about the sort of epithet Eastern and why it is often applied to the Orthodox Church is that there does seem to be a mindset when we look at the early church that uh, distinctively develops in the East as opposed to the West. Um, for instance, uh, Father Jonathan and I were talking about St. Augustine, for instance, that his influence is almost uh, zero 
uh, in the Eastern Church, where he has a massive influence in the Western Church. Uh, uh, writers, early church writers, not necessarily considered a saint. Uh, guys like Origen, who seem to have a, a bigger influence in the East, whereas Tertullian seems to have a bigger influence in the West, that there seems to be a, a different disposition uh, between the way that the East thinks about theology, the way that it thinks about the scriptures, uh, as opposed to uh, developments that take place in the West. And so that's sort of, I guess, what I was curious um, in regards to that question, is the Eastern more of a geographical uh, distinctive from uh, and just sort of a historical artifact from Father Jonathan's perspective, or is there truly sort of a different paradigm, a different mindset? You know, I've often heard of the orthodox noose, uh, the orthodox mind, uh, when it comes to uh, the, um, uh, the, the formulation of theology that seems to be very distinctive compared to the way that Catholics or Protestants think about theology. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. You can tell we got really knowledgeable folks here. My job is just to push buttons and look pretty, but I appreciate the knowledge coming out. So let's go deeper. Essential features. What are the essential features of the Eastern Orthodox Church? I understand you would just say the church from your perspective, from the Orthodox perspective. Essential features. Well, essential features. Um Deacons, priests, bishops, um, monastics. Monasticism is a, a huge component of, of orthodox uh, spirituality and teaching and so forth. Uh, the holy mysteries, the sacramental life of the church, uh, liturgical worship, these are all essential features. Uh, you can't take away any of those, really, and have a church that can express the apostolic nature of the church in its fullness, um, because all of these things contribute to what we are and how we see ourselves and things like that. And our very big distinctive differences, uh, on the other hand, between us and, let's say, uh, most of the Protestant Reformation churches, you know, the Reformed churches and so forth, um, certainly there's liturgical worship in, in some uh, Protestant churches. Um, there are sacraments in some Protestant churches. There are bishops in some Protestant churches. But, but everything I've just talked about has its place and its role and fulfills um, the mission and, and the vision of the Orthodox Church in a very specific and, and precise way. And I don't think you can take any of those things out of there. Take sacraments, for example, what we call the Holy Mysteries. I want to stop for a moment and, and share with your listeners why we call them the Holy Mysteries. You'll hear them referred to as the sacraments. And how many? There's seven, just like the Roman Catholics, although we would say there's more. But I want to mention why we call them the Holy Mysteries, why we prefer that rather than calling them sacraments. Um, the word mystery in its original Greek, mysterion, refers to a, a secret that is becoming, that is being revealed, as opposed, by the way, to the other Greek word, enigma, which refers to a, a secret that will never be known, can never be known. Right. But a mysterion is a secret that is being revealed. And we haven't yet fully arrived at the full revelation of what that is. But through the mysteries, Christ reveals himself. And we spend time with him in the Eucharist. We spend time with him in holy confession. We spend time uh, becoming him in holy baptism. Uh, being united to his body, in other words. Uh, so the holy mysteries are a way in which we participate in the life of God himself and in his holy body. Uh, some people like to describe it as a participation in the energies of God, and that through them we become continually united to him. We will never be fully united until the great day of judgment, but we become during our lifetime continually united to him, becoming more and more closer to him through our participation in the Holy Mysteries. So they form a really, really important part of who and what we are. They're central to, to everything we do. Um, you know, you're baptized to enter into the body of Christ. You're baptized so that once in the body of Christ, you can partake of the Eucharist. Do you sin? You've fallen out of 
being able to partake of the body uh, of the of the body and blood of Christ, you go to confession where you can repent and confess and go back um, and and get back into it. Uh, you know, everything focuses around that holy mystery of the Eucharist. Uh, that is something that is really uh, at the heart and soul of our spiritual life, of our liturgical life. It's something we look forward to every week, preparing for that 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 reception on Sunday morning. Is something that having left that Sunday morning, we go back out into, out into the world feeling um, empowered and rejuvenated and renewed and refreshed and strengthened to be able to do the will of the Lord in the coming week. Would you say that's so the are, role? I'm sorry. Is that the role they play in the life of the average Orthodox believer? Um, or maybe add something to it. You know, what role do the sacraments play in the average life of the average Orthodox believer? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they are central to the average Orthodox believer. Uh, participation in all of those things, confession, Eucharist. Of course, you only participate in baptism once and, and what we call chrismation, what the West calls confirmation. We only participate in baptism and, and Eucharist once. But we do that so that once joined to the body of Christ, once we have been enfleshed in him, we can then partake of the holy body and blood that he has left us as a sign of his um, both uh, time here on earth and his, his future coming. You know, he said, Jesus said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, he said, I have no part in you. So one of the things that is central to our understanding of participation in the life of Christ is that reception every week or even maybe more often in the body and blood of our Lord. You know, he said, my flesh is food indeed, my blood is drink indeed. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of God and drink his blood, you have no part in him. So that is really very, very central to us. That that sort of reveals to us um, the essence of the kingdom, participation in the life of Christ himself. And not only participation like, you know, playing along, but really um, becoming united with him, becoming one with him. In a, in a mystical way, hence the, the word holy mystery, in a way that we will probably never fully understand. Um, even in John 6, when he talked about this, my flesh is food indeed, my blood is drink indeed, it says at the end of his discourse, uh, and some of his disciples said, these are hard sayings, and some of them followed him no more. So clearly, uh, even back then, when the Lord himself was trying to teach this, there were people who could not understand nor accept it, and then uh, broke away, broke fellowship with him. But for us who understand what he's trying to say, or at least are trying to understand what he's what he's trying to say, uh, the Eucharist and the reception of the body and blood, that holy mystery is the, the, the central point of our liturgical and sacramental worship. Continue on that a little bit, if you could. The sacraments. Yes. The sacraments. What role do you believe they play in salvation, if you want to use a different word besides salvation, that's up to you. But well, I think that's a good word. We would ask, what role would you say they play in salvation? A very important role. Uh, first of all, for example, when on the day of Pentecost, <coughs> on the day of Pentecost, when G, oh, when Peter preached, and he finished preaching to the men who had gathered there on that great day, they said to him. Uh, what must we do to be saved? Now, that question is at the heart of every, every believer. They want to know that they are doing the right thing to be able to enter into the kingdom of God. And Peter's answer was very clear. He didn't say, I'm often fond of telling my parishioners, when you read the Bible, don't just read what's there, read what's not there. He did not say, well, pray this sinner's prayer and you'll be fine. No, that's not what he said. He said, repent, you know, confess your sins, repent, and be baptized. And he didn't say it <clears throat> just that one time. Every future opportunity he or Paul or anybody had to say it, it was repent and be baptized, repent and be baptized. That was the, me the method of entry into the, into the church. Once in the church, the holy mystery <clears throat> of this commemoration of Christ's death and resurrection, as often as you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you confess my death and, and my resurrection, uh, the Eucharist is a foretaste of what our heart longs for, which is eternal participation with Christ in the kingdom. So that participation in this world is given to us as what we would call a foretaste through the holy mystery 
of the Holy Eucharist, the body receiving the body and blood of our Lord. Jesus himself said it. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. So that reception of the Holy Eucharist is at the foundation of what we see as our participation in the life of Christ here and a foretaste of the kingdom to come. As you may know, us Reformed types aren't necessarily big fans ourselves of the whole, well, just say this prayer and, you know, uh, the sinner's prayer and, hey, yeah. Uh, um, that's part of our perspective. And Dr. Bob, share uh, more of our perspective, if you could, because this is a perfect place to do it, where you could, of course, ask a follow-up question. But uh, let's see what you want to say here. Yeah, so I think this is really bringing up uh, some good points that really highlight, I guess, where the full uh, difference that we would have with yeah. the Orthodox as Reformed would be. And that is, where do we locate how we know what the essentials of the faith are. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the questions I had tonight are to do with ecclesiology. Um, but uh, for instance, uh, Father Jonathan mentions uh, monasticism, for instance. And uh, from our perspective, that would be something that we see as a development in history uh, that cannot be located in that which we would consider the apostolic deposit of faith, which is the New Testament. Um, that from our perspective, this would be something that is clearly a later development, uh, for better or for worse, um, in the life of the church. Uh, and uh, I think that it, it also comes uh, back to this idea that I think what Father Jonathan has sort of brought out is that the Orthodox Church, from my understanding of what he has said, um, it is a sacramental church. The idea is that only those who are uh, within the canonical bounds as defined by the sacramental life of the Orthodox Church would be considered part of the Church of God. Um, I think the scriptures present uh, a, a very uh, a more nuanced uh, perspective of that. Um, and I'll just give a few lines from our own, well, at least my own church's confession, which uh, it is the 1689 Second London Confession, uh, which is a, I guess, a Baptist uh, edit of the Westminster Confession, uh, the famous Westminster uh, Assembly uh, that really launched the English Reformation. And I'd love to get uh, Father Jonathan's take on this after I read it, uh, as well as maybe have a little bit of a discussion on the nature of the scriptures and how the Orthodox Church views what the scriptures are, their authority, their relationship to tradition, uh, and to church authority. Well, that's so, one of our questions. We are definitely going to get to that. Yes, yes. All so, right, what, cha what chapter you want to go to here, Dr. Bob? Yeah, this is chapter 26 of the Second London Confession, where it says, The Catholic or universal church with which respect to the internal work of the Spirit and truth of grace, and notice that internal work of the Spirit, and truth of grace may be called invisible, consists of the whole number of the elect that have been, are, or shall be gathered into one under Christ, the head thereof, and is the spouse, the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. All persons throughout the world professing the faith of the gospel and obedience unto God by Christ according unto it, not destroying their own profession by any errors, averting the foundation or unholiness of conversation are and may be called visible, saints. So we see this dichotomy between the church has both a visible character to it and an invisible character to it, which I think if we were to really press, I think both sides would affirm. Um, we've all seen those who have uh, entered into communion, but have later renounced their profession of faith. You know, are those people then rightly considered part of the church? Can they be part of the church then leave the church, then get back into the church, then get out of the church. Um, so this is where I think the Reformed, you know, emphasis upon uh, sovereignty. And I have a video on my channel uh, talking about sovereign grace over against sacramental grace. Where we see uh, ultimately the church is a, a production of the work of the Spirit of God in the life of those whom he has, as Ephesians 1 says, before the foundation of the world, um, you know, predestined in love. 
Uh, and so continuing on, because uh, I think this will bring up some later discussion points as we launch into more of these deep dive questions. Paragraph three of chapter 26 of the Second London Confession says, the purest churches under heaven are subject to mixture and error. And some have so degenerated as to become no churches of Christ, but synagogues of Satan. Nevertheless, Christ always hath had and ever have shall have a kingdom in this world to the end thereof, of such as believe in him and make profession of his name. The Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church in whom by the appointment of the Father, all power for the calling, institution, order, or government of the church is invested in a supreme sovereign manner. I'll skip the next part because it talks about the Pope being the Antichrist, uh, which I think is beyond the, uh, the scope of this uh, uh, discussion. But uh, jumping down to paragraph five, it says, in the execution of this power wherewith he is so entrusted, the Lord Jesus call us out of the world unto himself through the ministry of his word by his spirit, those who are given unto him by the Father. There's language from John chapter six, which we just heard Father Jonathan refer to, that they may walk before him in all the ways of obedience, which he prescribeth to them in his word. Those thus called, he commandeth to walk together in particular societies or churches. So this is referring to local churches for their mutual edification and due to the and the due performance of that public worship, which he requireth of them. So I think one of the questions that uh, Father Jonathan gave to me before we uh, had our discussion tonight is how does the Protestant uh, answer uh, the charge of like what happened to the Church of the Apostles? What happened to the church that Christ founded? Did it die? Was there some great apostasy, as those in the more restorationist uh, strands would say? And the consistent historic reform profession is no, but we have a fundamentally different conception of the church, and that is that the church is imperfect, that only the word of God is theanustas. That is ultimately the heart of what, say, sola scriptura would be. It's not that there aren't lesser rules uh, in which we... Uh, have order and discipline maintained in the church, but that the word of God alone, or that the scriptures alone is in fact the word of God alone. Um, so we would take a look, for instance, at something like monasticism, and we would say that we can't locate this style of life, this um, uh, institution as it exists uh, and grows in, you know, in the, the third century on up into the medieval period, all the way to the time where Luther himself was an Augustinian monk, uh, that we can't locate that in the scriptures, therefore we reject that. Um, but it's not saying that the church has disappeared, but that the church is ultimately subject to the refining fire and to the refining lens that is the holy scriptures. <clears throat> all right, all right, all right. Uh, yeah, good old... London Baptist Confession got right here, 1689. Uh, Father Jonathan, you want to talk about that or go to the next question? Well, let, let's reserve that for, for discussion at some point. I think right. if we go right to that, we're going to get off on tangents in the discussion, which is going to take us off of our, our other questions, which may be more profitable to our viewers. I agree. I just want to make sure you don't feel like you can't... Uh, tack on questions or something like that if you want. Well, just, just let me know. I'll, okay? I'll just make two observations based on what, what uh, Dr. Bob said. First of all, whether monasticism is founded in uh, the scriptures or not is irrelevant. Number two, the I think I heard Dr. Bob say and read from the Baptist Confession that churches are imperfect. I, did I hear that correctly? Yes, that churches have um, that all even the purest churches under heaven are subject to mixture and error. Because okay, are... no, let me stop. wait, 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 let me stop you there. First of all, there cannot be multiple churches. There can only be one body of Christ. There can only be one church. There can't be multiple bodies of Christ that believe different things that are so radically different that they conflict with one another with regard to what the truth is. We don't believe that the church is an institution. We believe it has a visible institutional presence that you can see and point to, but the church is mystical. It's the body of Christ, and by definition, it cannot be imperfect. So we would vehemently disagree with that statement that, that churches can be 
imperfect and impure. That, that to us is absolutely inconceivable because the church is the bride of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. And by definition, the bride of Christ is pure and spotless and the body of Christ is perfect. So on that, we disagree. Yeah, I would, I would just make a quick clarification point that while I think there might be a reference here to denominations, it is also talking about local congregations as well. It's not referring exclusively to the idea of denominations. So I think we would say that, at least from our perspective, just and then we'll move on to the next question, unless Father Jonathan had more commentary, uh, is that- No, no, I mean, we, we could, we, we, I think, let, let's go on. I gotta plug yeah. my laptop in or I'm losing juice here. Okay, I would, I would suggest we go on unless anybody wants to really pursue that more. No, I'm, I'm done, move on. Uh, I think maybe, maybe Bob, you might be thinking along the lines of like, for example, Revelation 2, 5, Jesus says to the church there, you know, hey, watch out, I'm gonna come and take your lampstand away. So mm -hmm. like individual churches like that, I think is an element of what's being discussed. But let's go to the next thing because we definitely got some other things to discuss. And they're very important. Father Jonathan Ivanoff, what is apostolic succession? Oh, my. You know, I, I like that question, Vocab, and thank you for asking it, because the more and more I discuss with the, the non-Orthodox, um, you know, what, what is the Orthodox Church all about, the more we keep coming back to this as almost what I would call uh, a, a, a core question or a foundational question. It, for, for me to claim, as, as we did when you first asked me at the beginning, you know, what is the Orthodox Church? Oh, it's the Church of the New Testament. Well, there's a lot that undergirds that claim, and apostolic succession is at the very heart of it. And for people to understand why the Orthodox say that, you know, that we're the Church of the New Testament, they have to understand what we believe about and what we teach about uh, this concept called apostolic succession. Now, I would, um, I would simply say it's the provable historical fact that from the apostles of the past to the bishops of today, there exists an unbroken line clearly delineating what is and what is not the church. And that unbroken line exists in two ways, and both ways have to be there. There is an unbroken succession of men as bishops of the church, as overseers, as, as episcopi or episcopos, from one generation to the next, who have received from the previous generation the laying on of hands, so, so a physical transmission of what we could call a confidence in their oversight that they're about to um, exercise over the church, so a physical transmission of confidence and faith in this man that he is going to carry on the apostolic tradition. It's like a vote of confidence. But that, that's one. Number two, it's not just the laying on of hands, but it's the actual faithfulness to what has been previously taught and then taught to them. So the bishop has to not only have hands laid on him, but he has to be one who has had hands laid on him because the bishops laying hands on him are confident that he is accurately and faithfully, without change or addition, without plus or minus, carrying on what the apostles taught. So he has received faithfully what has been handed down, the very definition, by the way, of paradosis in Greek. He has faithfully received what has been handed down and has faithfully kept it and is going to faithfully pass it on. So that's what we would say apostolic transmission is, the faithful, accurate transmission of the apostolic faith from the time of the apostles to their disciples to their disciples to their disciples on through time to the present day. And we find no changes, no additions, no deletions and things like that in the core of what is believed. That's really important to, to, to make that point, that it's the faithful transmission of what the apostles taught to our day. Now, some people would say, oh, but you do things today they didn't do that day. You know, for example, take what Dr. Bob said earlier, monasticism. Monasticism has no um, bearing on, on the salvation of people, except the monks that are in the monastery. Um, I'm talking about the, the teaching of the apostles as it applies to the Trinity, 
as it applies to the two natures of Jesus Christ, as, a, as it applies to the person of the Holy Spirit, as it applies to what the body of Christ is, what the holy mysteries are, and things like that. The correct interpretation of teaching, dogma, and, and so forth in Holy Scripture. It applies to all of that, not necessarily the express, uh, uh, not necessarily the expressions of it at any point in time. Those can vary, and they have, and they do. But the correct teaching of what the apostles taught and transmitted from New Testament times. So when when people say what is apostolic um, uh, succession um, and, and how do we know we have it because we have bishops who know who ordained them who know who ordained them going back let's say for example my bishop uh, Archbishop Michael of the Orthodox Church in America we can see that transmission back through the Alaskan mission to the bishops in Russia because that's where the Orthodox Church in America derives its apostolic succession and from the Russians through Constantinople and the bishops of the Eastern Roman Empire through them going back to the Apostle Andrew and possibly others by the way so not only is there the physical transmission that vote of confidence I mentioned but clearly uh, as a church, keeping what the apostles have taught and, and, and living it today and then passing it on. So this is really important. Um, we believe Rome has that succession, that the Oriental churches have that succession in terms of the physical transmission, but we believe that they have left that succession by virtue of the fact that they have changed what was handed down, that there are differences in how they define things that we believe have always been and have been handed down from the beginning. So then based so, on that, Father Jonathan, yes. uh, you could have in, in your understanding the what you call physical apostolic succession, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee faithfulness or orthodoxy because you're saying Rome has one but not the other. Yeah, well, that's what we're saying. And, and unfortunately, we believe that while we share a, a millennium of common faith and so forth from the time of the apostles, uh, to about the year 1000, give or take. I have my differences in what is defined as the great schism, as those who have heard me before know. But basically, for the first millennium, we have an entire body of belief that's pretty much exactly the same. Were there differences? Yes, there were differences. Uh, but for the most part, we believed the same thing. After that first millennium, things started to change. We didn't change. We didn't change anything. We still believe to this day the same things that we did a thousand years ago, but they did. And whether it's filioque or whatever you want to point to, uh, uh, papal um, infallibility, uh, papal supremacy, and so forth, these are not things that were taught in the early church. Um, and so we believe that, unfortunately, they have left that apostolic deposit of faith, even though there is a physical transmission that continues to this day. All right. So within that, your what are, what would you say if you, like the, what's the short version of how you know out of all the people that claim it who has apostolic succession and who doesn't well um <laughs> our, our 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 pat answer would be the orthodox do but um i think let, that, that's a good question too vocab i really like that question let me try and phrase my answer this way um to answer the question, what happened to the church after the apostles died, um, I would point to a discussion that Paul had with Timothy, and where he told him, Timothy, my son, yes, Father Paul, um, Timothy, what I've taught you, teach to other men, so that they, in turn, can teach other men. Now, notice he's saying this to Timothy, and he never, ever says anything like that communally corporately to any church anywhere else he says it to timothy and i'm sure he said something very similar to titus because both of them were leaders in their various apostolic missions now if we look at if we look at paul as a first generation christian timothy because of his youth as a second generation christian because paul clearly cat uh, converted him and catechized him and so forth and then if we look at the men that timothy is instructed to teach as the third generation to whom uh, Timothy could commit what Paul committed to him so that when Timothy passes from the scene, somebody else will know what he knew. 
and then that transmission goes forward, then I would say to most people, if you could find out what that third and fourth generation of Christians believed, not just Paul and Timothy, because we kind of know that from the scriptures, but what did the people in the year 90, what did, the, what did people in the year 110 believe, in the year 130, 150, 180, 250, what did they believe? If we could find out especially what those third and fourth generations believed, uh, fourth, third and fourth generation Christians believe, wouldn't that be interesting? And most people say, yeah, I'd love to know what they believe, but we have that. And they're called the Apostolic Fathers, Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp of Smyrna, Irenaeus of Lyon. We know what they, they believe because they left writings which have survived and have come down to us to this day. So whether it's the bishop as the head of the church, whether it's the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, whether it's um, uh, immersive baptism, whatever it happens to be, they knew it back then. Uh, we don't believe in the Orthodox Church in the development of doctrine. We believe that what Christ delivered once and for all, as St. Paul says, what Christ delivered once and for all was perfect at that point. And there hasn't been a development. The, the Trinity wasn't developed as a doctrine. It was always believed. Christ's two natures were always believed and understood. Now, maybe they had to find the right language to express it and things like that. Um, the word essence was never used in the scriptures, but in the Nicene Creed, that word had to be used to express something that everybody knew and believed but had never really expressed before and then realized they needed a language for it. But that's not a development, that's just a clarification. It wasn't invented out of whole cloth. So when people say, how do we know where the apostolic succession is? Look what the apostles believed, look what the early church believed, and look what was passed on from generation to generation. We know this. There's clear documentation to it. And so this is something that is not only uh, attested to in, in Christian sources, but there are non-Christian sources, for example, pagan Roman sources, that bear witness to all kinds of things that Christians believed in, such as the cannibalism that took place in some of the Christian assemblies that was offensive to Romans. Why did they believe the Christians engaged in cannibalism? Because they believed they were eating and drinking flesh and blood. Where did they get that from? Well, the Christians, you know, don't didn't go around talking about it, but they learned it probably through torture and who knows what other means. But this is what we're trying to say as Orthodox Christians. There is definitely something about the early church that's not just contained in the scriptures. The truth is there. It doesn't have to be elaborated on. But how the Christians believed it and lived it and passed it on, that is known in the Apostolic Fathers and in everybody that came after them. And those readings still exist to our day. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you. This is definitely a place where we may even have some of our strongest disagreements when I think about the scope of everything. Um, Dr. Bob, I know you want to comment on this part just so people can hear, you know, our perspective. Someone asked, what does Dr. Bob believe? Well, Dr. Bob and I are both reformed, so we have a lot of similar beliefs uh, to my understanding and all that. Uh, Dr. Bob, what are some of the reasons, you know, that uh, Reformed Protestants like us have a different perspective? Help the audience understand that. <laughs> well, I, I think we would have some very strong disagreements with what uh, Father Jonathan has said in terms of what actually existed <laughs> in the first generations of the church. If I may, I'll read just a little bit of Philip Schaff's History of the Christian Church to sort of frame wow. Uh, sort of where we're coming from. Uh, so that can better help uh, Father Jonathan understand what our objections might be. So in section 60 of volume one, titled Apostles, Prophets, and Evangelists, oh, yeah. Paul says, the ministry originally coincided with the apostolate. So he's talking about the Christian ministry as the church was at first identical with the congregation of Jerusalem. No other officers are mentioned in the gospels and the first five chapters of the Acts. But when the believers began to number thousands, the apostles could not possibly perform all the functions of teaching, conducting worship, and administering discipline. They were obliged to create new offices for the ordinary wants of the congregations, while they devoted themselves to the general supervision and the further extension of the gospel. 
Thus arose gradually out of the needs of the church, though partly at the suggestion of the existing organization of the Jewish synagogue, various general and congregational offices uh, in the church. All these have their common root in the apostolate, so they partake also in different degrees in its divine origin, authority, and responsibilities. So we would have some commonality with what Father Jonathan would say. However, from my understanding of apostolic succession, and maybe he can clarify this, we talked a little bit about this offline, is that apostolic succession lies exclusively with the bishops. The idea is that in apostolic succession is that you have the 12 apostles and then the apostle Paul as one untimely born who are established as apostles in the church, as they are going uh, about their missionary journeys, whether that be in Judea, Samaria, and to the various ends of the earth, as they are going and spreading the gospel message, they are establishing local congregations in the cities in which they are traveling. And uh, in the model of apostolic succession that I understand the Orthodox to hold to, is that they established to rule over those congregations a single monarchical bishop who, through the laying on of hands, has been gifted with the apostolic ministry. So the idea is not so much that there are apostles today. Dr. Bob, Dr. Bob, if, uh, to, to, to prove what you're, what you're saying, to follow up, um, if I could read something real quick that I think is what you're telling the audience. Uh, this is chapter two concerning the sacraments. John... Carmaris in a pretty good book, a contemporary reader, Eastern Orthodox theology. It's a, like kind of like an anthology, and uh, by practitioners. And look what he says here about what you're saying. Through the sacrament of holy orders, this is page thirty, or priesthood by the laying on of hands by the bishops and the invocation of the Holy Spirit, the ministers of the church are specially consecrated. And here's the, here's some of the key parts. Check this out, everyone. The ordination of three degrees of church hierarchy, bishop, presbyter, and dean, is abundantly witnessed to by the New Testament as well as by the sacred tradition. All three orders of the of the clergy continue canonically and uninterruptedly in the Orthodox Church, the hierarchy of which traces its beginnings back through an unbroken succession to the apostles themselves. And so that's what the Eastern Orthodox claim is. They, they believe that is true. We don't believe that that's historically correct or accurate or that it necessarily guarantees orthodoxy, if, we, if, if we've discussed. But it's good to understand what's being said, to, to Dr. Bob's point. And then last sentence here. The, the sacrament of ordination possesses inside the Orthodox Church a great importance, and no one who is not in possession of the apostolic succession has any right to perform any sort of priestly or pastoral function. And again, that's page 30. Uh, Jonathan, <clears throat> I have sometimes trouble with the last name. Excuse me, let me get it right. Hold on. John Cameris. Okay. So, Dr. Bob, continuing on. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to continue to flesh out sort of what I understand Father Jonathan to be saying. And so the apostles leave behind bishops. And so the bishops today, par excellence, you know, carry forward the apostolic ministry. And what this necessarily entails is that the highest office in the church today is the episcopate. And that the episcopate exercises what we would, I guess, technically call like a sacerdotal priesthood, um, which is kind of a redundant term since sacerdotal was those things referring to priests. Um, so uh -huh. it's not just a superintendency that the bishops hold, an idea of sort of jurisdiction or order, but actually priestly function that the bishops hold to. And so from our perspective, and this is, you know, Calvin talks about this at length in book four of the Institutes. Um, and what, if you read the writings of the reformers, Luther, they, they all sort of discuss this. If it can be demonstrated historically and biblically that this threefold office of uh, church government, uh, we have bishop, then presbyters who are sort of standing in the place of the bishop in the local congregation, uh, followed by deacons who are essentially, you know, servants within the local congregation. If that threefold distinction can be disproven, the entire thesis of apostolic succession and hence authority 
claims that are made on the basis of that apostolic succession fall apart. Yeah, so, so that's, that's really kind of what, what it's all about. Be I mean. At least as we would understand it. Um, and I'll just give a, a, just put a few things in evidence um, in this regard, which this was when I, when I debated um, Brother Augustine back in August, um, I wish we had had some more time to, to flesh some of this out uh, because I'm, I'm not sure, I think we were talking past each other in a lot of ways. The whole point that I would, I would make there, so here's uh, some more uh, commentary from History of the Christian Church because I think Schaff as a Presbyterian Reformed writer is sort of getting at what we as the Reformed would understand of that, not only first generation, but second, third, and fourth generation. This would be our accounting of history, is that uh, in section 61, he says, we proceed to the officers of local congregations who were charged with carrying forward in particular places the work begun by the, the apostles and their delegates. These were of two kinds, presbyters or bishops, and deacons or helpers. They multiplied in proportion as Christianity extended, while the number of the apostles diminished by death and could in the nature of the case not be filled up by witnesses of the life and resurrection of Christ. So he was making a very, uh, I think, important distinction is that to be an apostle, you had to be a witness to the life and the resurrection of Christ, uh, which is why the apostle Paul is one who wasn't in Jesus's earthly ministry ordained as an apostle could still claim to be an apostle because of the Damascus Road experience in Acts 9. Um, so continuing on, he says, the extraordinary officers were necessary for the founding and being of the church, the ordinary officers for its preservation and well-being. And then here's where I think we get into the, di the differences. The terms presbyter or elder and bishop or overseer slash superintendent denote in the New Testament one and the same office, with the difference only that the first is borrowed from the synagogue, the second from the Greek communities, and that the one signifies the dignity that is elder, the other the duty. And then he goes and talks about the identity of these officers is very evident from the following facts. They appear always as a plurality or a college in one and the same congregation, such as Philippi. The same officers of the church of Ephesus are alternate, alternately called presbyters and bishops. Paul sends greetings by the bishops and deacons of Philippi, but omits the presbyters because they were included in the first term, also as the plural indicates. In the pastoral epistles, where Paul intends to give the qualifications for all church officers, he again mentions only oh, oh. bishops and deacons, but uses the term presbyter afterwards for bishop. Peter urges the presbyters to tend the flock of God and to fulfill the office of bishops with disinterested devotion without lording it over the charge allotted to them. The interchange of the terms continued in use to the close of the first century, as is evident from the epistle of Clement of Rome, chapters 42 and 44, and the Didache, chapter 15, and still lingered toward the close of the second. And he actually, uh, I think, quotes um, a, uh, an interpolation that we would reject that Irenaeus gives when he is referring to uh, bishops and elders in Acts chapter 17. Uh, Irenaeus actually inserts uh, the word bishops and elders uh, in his text uh, against heresies, chapter or book three, chapter 14. Uh, <laughs> And so what we would see is, is that rather than the episcopate, and this gets into, I guess it's covering the next couple questions regarding the priesthood and the episcopate, um, where our objection would be is that his, as historical fact, the office of episcopos or bishop is something that arises out of the congregation or the college of the elders within each local church, um, and only later comes to be identified with this concept of apostolic succession. And, and we see developments even within this office, extensions with the, the developments of archbishop and metropolitan uh, patriarch, who are all still considered bishops, um, but we see as the church grows and expands and as it uh, 
you know, further developments in history occur, you get further extensions of this language. And so, so I we, think, Dr. Bob, you're, you're bringing out what a lot of Protestants, not all, would hold to is, hey, you know, when you talk about bishop or overseer, those are to be, or presbyter, those are synonymous from the New Testament data, we would say, with yes. idea of elder, what sometimes people call pastor, although that's not exactly right, elders, pastor, the... Yeah, but uh, obviously the, 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 the ecclesiology of, of yeah. Eastern Orthodox would be different. And you're just talking about developments, but they have a different uh, perspective, of course. But I want to make sure, if wrap it up if you can. I want to make sure we get back to Jonathan Ivanov because, sure. uh, you know, I hear what you're saying, and we want to make sure people uh, see the different models. But uh, sure. I want to make sure we can get him to answer some more questions as well, please. Yeah. Yeah, th this will be my last uh, comment on this, and then I'll let him have free reign uh, uh, for as long as he needs. Uh, so Acts chapter 20, I think, is a, a passage that we discussed. And I think this is really, for me, particularly as I examine the, the claims of the Orthodox Church, where the rub really is. So Paul says in verse 17, this is him going on uh, you know, his trip to Jerusalem, where he's then going to be sent to Rome to face trial before uh, the emperor. Uh, he's planted the church in Ephesus, and so the elders are coming to him at Miletus. So it says, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus, this is Acts chapter 20, verse 17, and called to him the elders, plural, of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time. And so he goes on in the next few verses talking about how he ministered among them, how he established them, how he taught them from city to city. He's predicting in verse 23, the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies me in every city. Bonds and afflictions await me. So the context is carrying forward. He's addressing the same group of men. And so he says in verse 26, and then I'll wrap up here with uh, verse 28. Uh, Therefore, I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all men. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you episcopoi. And we translate that overseers in many English translations, but it's bishops. So plural, to shepherd or pastor the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And so we would see in that context that the elders and the overseers are being equated. So the monarchical bishop model that is required for apostolic succession, from our perspective, is not part of the apostolic deposit but it is in fact a later historical development. And so everyone, what you're hearing there really, when you heard Father Jonathan Ivanov answer, and then Dr. Bob speak, the differences of perspective on what has happened historically as well as theologically. One more quote from, from an Orthodox source, and then we're gonna to get to the next question, which has to do with the role of the priesthood in the church, the role of the priesthood. And this is from John Mayendorf, another Eastern Orthodox scholar. And just kind of, kind of understand the EO perspective about the importance of apostolic succession, how that relates. One last quote that I think is helpful. Listen to this from page 85. This is from Eastern Orthodox Theology, a contemporary reader. When the apostles passed from the scene, it was within the framework of the local eschatological and sacramental communion of the Eucharistic assembly that the apostolic tradition was preserved. Occupying the Lord's own place in the assembly, the bishop possessed a certain charisma of truth. Without claiming any personal infallibility, he was the guardian of the tradition coming down without interpretation from the apostles, a tradition that also had to be justified by the unity of the faith, which was maintained by all the members of each church and which bound together all the local churches." End quote. So that's the Orthodox understanding of herself and also of other churches. Um, and of course, as you heard Dr. Bob as he was speaking, the churches outside the EO do not agree. You know, that's where that's where a massive element of the contention is. And uh, I'm just bringing that up. You know, it's, of course, it's not just Protestants. It'd be Rome as well. And uh, I think I think it, this is important to understand um, just how important ecclesiology is in these discussions, uh, both both past and present. Uh, Jonathan, I have enough, you can follow off from that, or we can go to the next question, which is... Well, Cap, let me, the let me make... Priests. Uh, yes. Let, let me try and make one quick point, and I think this is very important, and to the people who are viewing this podcast, uh, think about this. 
Mm -hmm. The thing that we love to do when we engage in such discussions like this is we love to discuss what the scriptures say. Let's place something in perspective. St. Paul's letters to which we are referring were written in the 50s. Mm -hmm. The Gospels were written in the 60s, St. Luke's in, in probably 70. And St. John's Revelation, Gospel and, and Epistles, probably not till the 80s and 90s. The problem that we have here is we're debating ecclesiology in the 50s of the first century. That's all the information we have. We don't have anything until Clement writes from Rome and until St. Ignatius in, in around the year 95. And we don't have anything after that until Ignatius writes something around the year 110 when he wrote his epistles to the different churches on his way to martyrdom in Rome. And the point would be that between the 50s and at least the 90s, we don't know exactly what happened. But we know that by the 90s and the 100s, that the church looked a little bit different. Now, we may be arguing about whether presbyter and episcopos mean the same thing and so forth, but the fact of the matter is, St. Paul, whose language I think was very precise, did use two separate words to describe an office that may not have been clear, but certainly there was a difference between the presbyters that gathered uh, uh, around the community and one of them that exhibited oversight and episcopos over that community. There clearly could only be one voice that ran the community, just as St. James ran the First Council in Jerusalem. There just couldn't be many voices. You have to have one person who ultimately makes the decision and who holds everybody accountable. So between the 50s, when Paul wrote all this, until the 90s and 100s and 110s, we don't have a, a, a very well-written body of witness but it's very clear that something did start to develop in the 50s, and by the 90s, it was clear how it played out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Priesthood, its role in the church, and you might even speak here about differences between y'all and Rome or other bodies, but importance of the priesthood within your church. Sure. Um, we have to go back to the 50s and <laughs> what Paul was writing about uh, back there. Well. Let, let's remember, um, let, let, me, let me start by saying this. Today, in the Orthodox Church, when a man is ordained uh, from the diaconate to the priesthood, the bishop reads a prayer over him. And regardless of what that prayer is in English or any other language, in Greek, this is how it's translated. The grace divine which heals that which is infirm and completes that which is lacking elevates through the laying on of hands the devout deacon vocab to be a presbyter to be a presbyter men who are raised from the rank of deacon up are are ordained as presbyters as elders that's what the greek says that's what that ancient greek prayer of ordination of the laying on of hands says it's translated into english and other languages as priest and so forth um, but we also have to remember that the English word priest does not come from the Greek word erefs. You look up your Greek, you'll know what that means. But was a evolution in English from presbyter to the word priest. That there is a clear evolutionary um, lineage from presbyter to, to priest in the English language. Now, did you just uh, sneak me into the Eastern Orthodox Church, by the way? As oh, I don't remember. I could have been uh, said, transported by the Holy deacon, Spirit someplace uh, briefly there. Um, deacon vocab. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, but, but, but here, here's the, the point I kind of want to make. Um, in, in the Orthodox understanding of the priesthood, Jesus Christ is the great high priest and offers himself eternally in the liturgy that Isaiah saw and Ezekiel saw and John saw and so forth and so on. And when the bishop serves uh, at the holy altar, he becomes the image of the great high priest, Jesus himself. And when the bishop can't be at the front of the altar at my church, and I'm serving in his place as his duly designated representative, I perform his priestly functions. I become, in other words, you could say, I become a priest when I serve in his place, because the bishop can't be everywhere all the time. So the idea of um, priests um, 
in, in the Orthodox Church, uh, you know, what are they? They are the agents of the bishop in the local Eucharistic communities who represent not only the bishop, but who represent Christ to the people there, who, who model him, who, uh, you know, this is why St. Paul said in a couple of places, what you see and hear in me do. In Hebrews, what you see your leaders do, follow them, you know, emulate them, copy them. You know, he says copy Christ, but he also says follow your leaders and copy and, you know, how they are and how they act and so forth. Copy that. These are godly people. They're put there for a reason. Copy them too. They're giving you an idea of how you can do it. And so the priest is a, a, a role model. He's a stand in he's a lot of things but he's there to represent to represent to represent christ to the people in that eucharistic community if i could uh read one other thing here from eastern orthodox theology john karamis that i i think uh ex explains it as well um <clears throat> listen to this uh I found this helpful. Through the action, so this is the Eastern Orthodox perspective, through the action of the sacraments, the salvific power of God completes in us the process of sanctification. This is accomplished in all who are truly faithful by the grace and power of the Holy Spirit. It is for this reason that the sacraments occupy such a prominent position in Orthodox conscience. Indeed, the whole meaning of the Church is realized in the sacraments, the Church being at the same time the fullness of the body of Christ and members in particular and then uh goes on a little bit now and 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 speaks about the importance of them and uh one of the things that i think is similar to what you just said there page 23 we see then first of all that the priest as performer of the sacrament is simply the instrument of the invisible and actual celebrant the lord himself and so uh there is a deep tie a deep connection with an eastern orthodox theology between the priesthood and the sacraments especially in in that way um and i think that's important for people to begin to grasp as well what about this the priesthood what is uh how does it relate to apostolic succession and how does that relate to the episcopate how do how do those things really so Episcopate. How do they relate? Well, um, succession, the, the, priesthood. How do those things relate? Um, to apostolic succession, it doesn't. The priesthood really doesn't relate. Priests, presbyters, really don't relate at all to apostolic succession. That is just something that the bishop relates to and directly has and, and, and influences uh, and see, carries yeah, with him. Let me rephrase wait, it. Wait, I'm sorry. On. What I mean now, to say is more along the lines of how does the episcopate relate to apostolic succession? How does the episcopate relate to the priesthood? That's what I – sorry, I, I made it seem like all three. You know, how does that – how do those three relate? Okay, well, I think we covered apostolic succession earlier, and that's passed on from bishop to bishop. Mm -hmm. I think I think we were good on that one. No, do you want me to talk no, a little I, I bit more? So. I think so. I think so. Okay, so the, the bishop has that. Now, when he stands at the front of the altar and leads the Eucharist com uh, Eucharistic community in worship, uh, he is representing Christ and bringing Christ through the sacraments to the people. And when he is not there, he delegates to the presbyters his authority to do the same. So when we act in, in sacerdotal functions, liturgically, sacramentally, and so forth, we are acting in his authority with his authority in his place uh so i guess you could say i guess you could say in that way in that manner we are performing an apostolic function we are we are performing an apostolic office i guess you could say that uh we don't often use those terms but i guess you could put it that way i don't know vocab is that does that answer your question dr bob bring some clarity yeah so it's you just Father Jonathan actually just hit on a buzzword that, you know, really sort of made my antennas go up because I, I would love to sort of plumb this a little bit further. Um, I think we've talked enough about apostolic succession and about the, you know, sort of the episcopate, but maybe really diving into what is the role of the priest and what is the intent in his priestly activity? And I may, I can follow that up with, you know, it, when we see the Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament, you know, they're offering sacrifices for sin. They're, they're performing expiatory acts to win propiti propitiation for the people. So what would the, 
how the Orthodox view sort of their relation to the Old Testament Levitical priesthood and to Christ's superior Melchizedek priesthood? Is there a participation sort of in a special sense that the Orthodox bishop and by extension, the, the parish priest in the local parish church, is there a role that they are playing uniquely uh, in sharing Christ's Melchizedek priesthood uh, that yes. say a lay person or an, a, someone who's not ordained would play? Uh, so if you could sort of expound upon that a little further, that uh, I think that would be. Uh, well, yeah, the, the, the short answer is yes, because in the in the early apostolic communities, as shown in uh, Acts and then moving forward, as we've we've spoken about, not just anybody could get up and offer the bread and the wine that that fell to the presbyters and specifically to the episcopos of that particular uh, community uh, who was put into that place by Paul or by one of the other uh, apostles. So to say that is there a special role and function? Absolutely, there is. And going even further, um, priests and, and, and bishops by extension don't. Um, and, and I got to be careful how I pick my words because people are going to misunderstand this. They don't mediate salvation. I think people get this um, the, this idea that somehow in the Orthodox Church or in the Catholic Church that everything from the laity has to go through the clergy so, and the clergy talk to God and they make it possible for people to be saved or something like that. Um, and I've heard people kind of explain it that way. That's not quite how we see it, although there is a role to play, a, a sacerdotal role that priests and, of course, bishops, because they exercise their authority, there's a role they play in the life of the Eucharistic community. For example, um, the, the, the Didache, the Apostolic Constitutions, talk about not just anybody offering the bread and wine, but only a, 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 a bishop or, or a presbyter of his designation. Uh, you have the, the biblical admonitions uh, from Jesus himself, whatever sins you bind uh, on earth are bound in heaven, whatever sins you loose on earth are loosed in heaven. And if that was given to the apostles and the apostles gave that authority to their successors, then clearly the priests have a sacerdotal function to bind and loose here on this earth. That that would be scriptural is the way we see it. Now, I know people disagree with that, but that's the way we see it. And that's the way the church has seen it since the very beginning, from the time of the scriptures through the apostolic period, the post-apostolic period, and so forth. So, yes, they do perform a function in the sense of bringing the mercy of Christ, the peace of Christ, the love of Christ, the presence of Christ, the grace of Christ, and the grace of the Holy Spirit, into the community and making salvation real and possible and actualize it in a way that would not be possible without that sacerdotal priesthood. So, um, so can, I, can I ask another question? This is really good, by the way. I love this uh, this line of thought. If, if, if you do as well, Father Jonathan, uh, I'd, I'd love to continue sort of maybe just a little bit further down this before we jump to the next question. Um, so if he's not mediating salvation, and this is the clarification question for me, what what is the relationship between the role that the priest plays in the Orthodox conception and Christ's role as we see outlined in Hebrews 7 through 10 in his mediatory work as Melchizedek priest? Okay, there... very good. Um, let me, um, in, in order to, uh, that, that's kind of a, a big answer, a good question, by the way. Let, let me try and highlight a, a problem in terminology, okay? Because I think it will highlight the, the question. And I'm gonna turn, as an example of, of this problem, I'm gonna turn to Mary. Now, a lot of people don't understand, don't they really don't correctly understand the Orthodox uh, um, teaching on, on the, intercessory, uh, the intercession of the saints and the intercession of Mary. And people will say, why do I need Mary uh, uh, I've, I've got Jesus Christ already, and then they'll quote scripture where it says that he's the mediator between God and man. You know, there, there's one person who does that, and that's Jesus. Okay. There's a difference, and people have to remember this when we're discussing this. There's a difference between mediator and intercession. Mm -hmm. Mediation and intercession. There's a difference between, between one who mediates and one who intercedes. They are different roles. There's only one mediator between God and man, and it's not Mary, and it's not the saints, it's Jesus Christ. But there are many intercessors between us and Jesus. 
we have each other, we have Mary, we have the saints, and so forth. So there's many intercessors, but there's only one mediator. And I think that then kind of um, allows us, and, and again, I know I'm glossing over a lot to explain this, but having said that by way of introduction, we could then say that allows us to segue to what the priest and what the bishop are. Because if to the bishop and from him to the priests are given, for example, the power to bind and loose, then that's a huge, huge, huge uh, source of mediation and not just inter intercession. I'm not talking between us as, as priests to God, but I'm saying us directly to Jesus Christ. Because if I see that someone has committed a sin and they're not repentant of it and they don't want to repent of it, but they want to come to church and have communion and things like that, and, and I deny them that and they get all mad at me because uh, they're some guy's living with his girlfriend and he's not repentant over it and he won't give it up. Well, sorry, you can't come to communion. And furthermore, you're committing fornication, which clearly in the scriptures has been called a sin. And until you repent of it, you're living in sin and your soul is in eternal danger. So until you repent of that and show me true contrition, I, as a priest, cannot offer you sacramental confession, uh, sac you know, repentance and, and forgiveness of sins. I can't because you're not sorry. You're not repentant of it. You haven't confessed it. You're not repentant. Um, and, and therefore, unfortunately, and I know a lot of people don't like this, um, I cannot offer him confession, uh, uh, absolution. I cannot loose the sins by which he now has been has bound himself. And that, I believe, is scriptural. But that makes me, in many ways, not an intercessor, but a mediator between that man's sins and, and Jesus our Lord. Because the power to bind and loose has been given to the apostles, from them to their successors, the bishops, and from the bishops to their representatives, the presbyters. One last question on this, and then I think we can move on to the next ones. And, and if we, we can vocab, I think we can probably sort of skip about jurisdictions, maybe just talk about scripture and tradition before we get to the practical questions. We're going to um, have to, because we are at an hour and a half. Yes. <laughs> so we'll, we'll need to sort of do some triage here. There's a medical term. Uh, so you mentioned that Christ has a mediatorial role and that, you know, fellow Christians, the saints, Mary had this intercessory role. Does Christ and his priesthood, though, also have an intercessory role in addition to his mediatorial role? Define mediatorial and define intercessory. So mediation would be, uh, I guess, the, the ability to affect uh, reconciliation between two parties. You know, he's the go-between between the two parties, whereas the, the intercessor um, is sort of one who is on the level of the one who needs intercession. So this would sort of relate to Christ's humanity uh, mm -hmm. and, and his role as priest. Because uh, the reason I say that is, um, you know, Hebrews 7.25, and Bible verse says, therefore he's able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. But it seems from my perspective, and one of the reasons we would, this is a slight tangent, not invoke, uh, you know, ask, ask the saints to pray for us, those who have since departed, is that Jesus's intercession is also sufficient to save forever. Maybe that's a little bit of a tongue twister, but um, I, I guess that this sort of what I'm ultimately getting is like, what what is the the effect or the intention of the priest's intercession on behalf of the communicant? What is it supposed to affect? And how does that relate to what Christ's work affects on the cross? Well, okay. Uh the, the the priests the, the priest is always concerned about the salvation of those who in Hebrews it, it's, it's made very clear there and elsewhere of those souls entrusted to his care for which he will have to give an account on the day of judgment I do not relish that task believe me when I say that that is an awesome responsibility that there are people um, that people should know that in a in, in an Orthodox Church at least there are those that are keeping watch over their souls to whom this this watch has been in, in, entrusted and that they will have to give an account on the day of judgment. So 
the um, I'm sorry, where was I going with that? I, I thought I was going to start talking as a, as a way of answering your, your point there. Um, but we take that role very seriously in terms of helping people in our parishes uh, uh, work out their salvation with fear and trembling by understanding their sins, confessing their sins, repenting of their sins, uh, drawing closer to Christ, deepening their prayer life, um, loving their, 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 their fellow man made in the image and likeness of God more each day, loving God in whose image and likeness they have been made more each day, and becoming more Christ-like day by day. And that, that uh, process, um, we usually talk about sanctification. You might refer to it as deification. Yeah. yeah. All right, all right, all right. Uh, Bob, what question do you want to skip to? I kind of... I kind of want to get to some of the, the practical questions. Maybe, you know... I give, don't me know a number, how right? give me a number. Yeah. I, I, sort of two questions I want to follow up with. Um, we can probably combine some of these. I want to get his take on sort of the online Orthodox apologetics <laughs> community, sort of what the positives and negatives are. And then because it's so practical and it's so real world right now, I would like to get his take on the Ukraine situation, <laughs> specifically as it relates to the Moscow Constantinopolitan schism. So those All are right. the the practical questions I'd want to finish up with. All okay. right, let's do one at a time. Can we do uh, the Ukrainian crisis first? You know, the whole thing's got the world on edge. Of course, the media focuses on the political aspect. Uh, but the fact is that the Eastern Orthodox Church uh, is relevant uh, to the crisis. And so let's discuss that. As recently as about four or five years ago, all of the heads and synods of all of the autocephalous Orthodox churches around the world um, recognized, and, and, and they are on uh, record, written record as having said it, they're on uh, you know, videos having said it, recognized the Ukrainian uh, uh, Orthodox Church, the, the Church of Ukraine under the Moscow Patriarch, as being an integral part of the Moscow Patriarch and Metropolitan Unufri, that that's his name, Unufrios, Unufri. Metropolitan Unufri was the rightful leader of that church. This was as recently as four or five years ago. Now, during uh, since that time, the Constantinopolitan uh, See has seen fit to take uh, a number of men, some of whom were deposed from the priesthood, deposed from the um, episcopacy, some who had never been ordained, and elevated many of them uh, to roles of, of bishop and took them and formed a church within the canonical territory that had already been acknowledged uh, not that much earlier. And now all of a sudden we have a competing Orthodox church uh, in Ukraine, the OCU. Um, that has caused a firestorm around the world. Uh, not even all the Greeks agree with it. Uh, you know, there are great, the, 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 the um, Archbishop of Athens spoke up for that new church. Many of the other bishops have said, no, this is not right. The Archbishop of Cyprus spoke up in support. Many of his bishops on the synod said no and said no vehemently so much he wanted to shut them up. And there was a, quite the scandal there about that. Uh, in Alexandria, the, the um, Patriarch of Alexandria had served in Ukraine, had served with Onufri, had acknowledged him as the rightful leader of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, and then two years ago decides, nope, I guess not. I'm going to recognize this new uh, group of guys who were deposed and who were schismatic and blah blah blah, uh, and you know created a church from them. And now he's done that, and many and many of the bishops, if not a lot of the presbyters uh, and priests in that church, do not agree with that. So you've got what is essentially a mess in Ukraine, now in Africa, because the church is based, uh, the Russian church is basically opening up exarchates in Africa to evangelize there uh, in spite of the Alexandrian Patriarchate. So you've got a mess. And uh, the only thing at this point I think that's really going to fix it is a the convening of a, uh, a, a worldwide council at which every Orthodox church w will, will or should attend. And this, this problem be aired out once and for all with everybody there. Do you think the last thing you said for a solution, 
honestly, do you think that's possible? Uh, do I maybe, think it's possible? Yes. Do you think it's I think happen? it's possible. You know, um, a lot of people didn't foresee the fall of the Soviet Union. And those uh, that did, or, or when it did happen, nobody saw the resurgence of the Russian Orthodox Church uh, in Russia and Ukraine and Belarus, wherever, Kazakhstan. Nobody saw that happening the way it has happened. I mean, the Orthodox Church in Russia right now is building every year for the last 10 years. They've been building a thousand churches a year and ordaining 10,000 men a year. Nobody would have seen that 10, 15, 20 years ago. So is it possible? Yes. How would it happen? That's up to the Holy Spirit. God will not be mocked. I believe that very strongly. When people fret and worry and everything, I say, you know what? God has this in control. When the, when the communists thought they were in control, and the, finally the Iron Curtain fell and then the Soviet Union fell, um, there was a lot of humbling that took place amongst those who thought they could lord it over the church and then found themselves out of power. I, I think it's possible, and I, I hope and pray that it will happen, but I think that's the only way it will happen. As we look at uh, some of these issues that are really complex, it seems, at least to me, that the momentum and energy, maybe even a lot of the, the resources, is really, at this point in history, uh, out of all the Eastern Orthodox churches, with the Russian Orthodox Church the most— and uh, doesn't seem to be abating anytime soon. And so that does yeah. create for some interesting situations because, you know, as, as you know, but audience, you know, they were kind of granted <laughs> their, uh, to use a term, authority or, 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 or right to exist at extent by earlier churches. They weren't part of that, the, the original, you know, holy sees. Does, they do come later. And yet that's where a lot of the, um, for lack of a better word, to use a non-technical word, action is. Although, you know, it seems like gravitas and prestige is especially with the Greek Orthodox Church, but the numbers and is not quite the same. And it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. Um, Bob, I know you want to ask a follow-up question on that one, and I think people were interested in, in, in this part of the discussion as we wind down. But I, but I do want to see what you might want to say to that. Yeah, no, um, I, I think that uh, he's. <laughs> Why do people do that? that? Yeah, What's no, that? you guys crack me yeah. up. Sorry, Bob, I'm just making fun of you a little bit. I know you want to follow up. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's my way of uh, gathering my thoughts together because uh, it's certainly a complex issue. As uh, I'm just God. teasing you, Bob. But hey, shout out to Sam Miguel for the super chat. I never thought I'd have a discussion with a couple of reform guys. Father Jonathan Ivanov, and then have an ex Hebrew Israelite current atheist giving in the super chat. But that's what just happened with Sam Miguel. So thank you, Sam Miguel. Go ahead, Dr. Bob. Yeah. So, sort of, I guess, from the outside looking in, what is challenging for us to sort of get a hold on. Um, I certainly have family who are in Eastern Europe who are at least tangentially affected by what's going on. Um, but from a Christian perspective, um, you know, you talked a little bit about the mechanisms for potentially solving the crisis, but how would one know who is in the right now? So say that that mechanism for solving it doesn't happen for 100 years and the schism persists for 100 years. And then one side or the other ends up prevailing in a, a, an ecumenical council, you know, 100 years from now. How is the local Orthodox Christian on the ground to know which church is part of the body of Christ and which church is not a part of the body of Christ. Well, people, um, I, I think, unfortunately, in this uh, Ukrainian and, and now African situation are coming down very much in terms of the tribe to which they belong. So if you're Greek, you back the ecumenical patriarch. If you're Slavic of any kind or, or in Rokor or whatever, a church, you're automatically backing the Russians. So it's because the division has become, unfortunately, very tribal. And it's a very difficult uh, thing to discuss dispassionately and so forth. People just don't want to listen. They, they've already formed their opinions in their camps and things like that. Having said that, uh, the, the process of 
convening councils in the past took a long time. Uh, now we have uh, the ability to do that much more quickly because we have the ability to communicate much more quickly. Um, the church has had schisms before. We're just seeing one play out right now. Uh, we forget how, how horrible some of the schisms of the past were, how violent they happened to be and things like that. Um, fortunately, this has not become violent yet, except in U Ukraine, there has been violence between the schismatic church and the, and the uh, Ukrainian church under Russia, um, the violent taking of, of churches, the, the forcible physical taking of churches, the beating of, of, of people and things like that, that has taken place there. Um, but we haven't seen anything like uh, the iconic class tr controversy or the, uh, the riots that happened during some of the other times of the ecumenical council. So um, hopefully this too will pass because everybody's kind of sees how this is playing out in a very public way on the world stage and, and nobody likes it. I don't think anybody really is in favor of schism or division the way we see it. So I think it's gonna, uh, you already hear, you're already hearing calls for councils from, from places you never would have thought of. I just have to hope and pray that the Holy Spirit will in time prevail in the hearts and minds of many and that we will have that council and fix it. Thank you for the response. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Um, last question on our list we can maybe get to. Uh, you can, as far as I'm concerned, because we're not trying to get you in trouble or anything like that, you can be as politically correct as you want, but maybe a general assessment of sort of the almost what, what's really an orthodox online community, sometimes called the orthosphere, populated sometimes people might say by ortho bros. Uh, it is interesting to at least here somewhat, no matter how you got to parse it out, your perspective on it. Uh, Bob once said okay. strengths, weaknesses, positive, negatives, maybe something like that. Okay, but sure. You know, St. Paul traveled to where the people were. He engaged in, in marketplaces and, and in the areas where people congregated. The Internet today is very much today's agora. It, it's very much the common aggregate marketplace where people meet and talk and discuss and things like that. So if you're going to talk about orthodoxy, you're going to get on the Internet and you're going to form a, a, a chat room or a podcast or something like that. The, the positives of orthodox. Now, let me just speak. Let me take a step back from the orthosphere, because I know what you mean by that. Let me take a step back from that for a moment. Just talk about orthodox spirituality or apologetics or whatever. The positives are numerous. For example, the, the reason for the trend in the first place is precisely the number of people converting to orthodoxy. And that's a very good thing. Say what you want about him. I know some, some priests who will acknowledge that Jay Dyer has brought more young men into the church than anybody else in our, in our day and age. And he's not even clergy. The so, Billy Graham of the Eastern Orthodox Church is Jay Dyer. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, no, I'm just telling you what people are saying. <laughs> no, I know, I know. I think Jay Dyer has said that himself, too. <laughs> oh, well, he, and he would be right from what I'm hearing. I have to say, I've, I've never seen one, one of his episodes or a lot of the other guys that are, that are often mentioned, uh, but I hear about them from other people. Um, but, but this has caused orthodoxy to get more and more notice and more and more exposure and has led to the creation of a lot of very wonderful ministries. You know, um, um, some that have been around for a while, like Ancient Faith, uh, Free Indeed Ministries, St. Vladimir's, uh, they're all doing great work uh, in, in many ways, large and small. The negatives are primarily that not everyone who is engaging in these apologetics is qualified to do so. I'm, I'm not inferring anybody in particular. Right, Dr. Right. Eugenia Constantino in her wonderful book, Thinking Orthodox, which I would highly recommend to anybody who wants to understand the orthodox mind, forget studying theology, get that book and read it. It's really wonderful. She talks about this, that not everybody that gets up in, in the orthosphere or, in, or, or on the internet as an orthodox Christian to talk is qualified to do so. Um, hey, that's, now that's, that's not that's to say true. that there that's, aren't. That's true on our side too. You know, yes. we, we 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 have sympathy for you there. Yes. Okay. Well, um, it, 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 I, it, I think as you say, it is a problem in any religion. Um, you know, everybody's bound to have an opinion. The thing about the internet is it gives everybody an outlet to, to voice that opinion. Uh, but the unfortunate side of social media in general, and and I think especially of apologetics, um, is that it's not carried out with with tact. With, with wisdom or, or discretion or even understanding. 
And, and I think that's why a lot of Orthodox Christians don't engage on social media anymore, because the experience they've had has been a, a very negative one. Vocab, look at yourself. You were complaining about the, the, um, the, um, um, not, no, what, what the word is, is the word, uh, the people not being nice, you know, uh, when engaging with you or others, uh, of this type. And I don't know how you and I got hooked up, but, but your first, co um, podcast with me, I think the title was something like, uh, polite Orthodox Christians or something like that. Is that, that's as if, as if you what found I was it. going for, cause I was tired of yeah. all the, um, uh, vitriol i was receiving i mean it's the internet so i'm not really you know taking it too personal but it's like come on guys so i was trying to, to to go for something different that's why i titled it that way and that's why we're glad you and the other guys came on yeah that's what i was shooting for yeah, yeah. you know and and i think we need to have more of that kind of stuff and sometimes uh i just want to say and i'm not I, gosh i don't want to come off to sounding like i'm accusing anybody of this but sometimes when someone has moved from a, a, a position, and, and let's even be more specific, let's say a Calvinist position. When someone has moved from a Calvinist position to an Orthodox position, they tend to look back on where they came from with, with disappointment and sometimes even anger, because they look at what they came from as, take your pick, inferior to uh, you know Orthodoxy, and they get mad. You know, why didn't I ever know this? Why didn't any, anybody ever tell me about this? And they, they, they know what they've rejected, and they get very vehement with people that try to defend what they've already rejected. I see a little bit of that on different, different sites. And I, and I think we can agree to disagree, but I also think that there are, there are those differences we need to discuss. Why? You know, the body of Christ can't have multiple opinions. So, you know, I, I, I would love to be able to talk about things like salvation and, and things like that. We just obviously don't have the time. Um, but but those things need to be discussed in a way that allows us to both find out whether we have common ground. Maybe we agree to disagree on some things. Uh, maybe, um, in, you know, we have a way of putting things, and I've heard people say this, uh, in a way that they say, you know, I never heard that before. And, um, and I think, if anything, maybe that's a good thing that we're bringing things up in a way that people haven't heard uh, before and maybe at least can consider and think about and reflect on and pray on and things like that. And maybe they don't agree with us, but at least we come to a better place where they know what we truly believe and, and we can have a discussion from there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, um, I mean, we're, we're reformed. And so I, I feel like this is just, let me just share my, honestly, I didn't grow up reformed. So it's not like something of like, look what I've inherited or something. Um, Coming into it and, and, and believing it wholeheartedly over time, because believing it's biblical, I feel like if you're reformed, you should have a certain level of robustness and uh, what I might call debate stamina. And what I mean, I don't mean by you can argue with people for a really long time. What I mean is you can handle dissenting opinions and listen to them and all that. And also... Reform folks should not really be very afraid to have people exposed to different ideas and all that. Now, I'm not saying throw sheep out there and don't protect them from wolves or anything like that. Um, so someone will twist everything you say on the Internet. But I'm saying a certain level of like, look, we really believe that the, the Lord has, has purchased his elect. We really believe that he holds us in. And so we knowing that and knowing that Christ is truth – uh, this will only help us grow in our understanding and, and, and we'll be able to process it and learn as we, I, I just feel like, especially reform folks should be able to do that and, 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 uh, can be bold in what they believe, but that doesn't mean you have to be mean or rude or dislike the people yeah, you're talking I agree. to. I agree. And, uh, that can be a mistake. You know, people talk about it, they'll sometimes say cage stage Calvinism and, um, you know, I, I don't definitely don't hang out with all Calvinists because, uh, uh, some of them would make me sick if I just hung out with a bunch of Calvinists all the time. And so I'm down to chill with whoever. But some of the EO guys online are trying to compete with the Hebrew Israelites with who annoys me most. <laughs> I got to tell you. And so I, you, you EO folks who are like that, 
Lord, help me pray for them more because y'all need to be prayed for. And I say that partially in jest, but not just in jest. And shout out to Benjamin, our resident Roman Catholic, for the super chat and his encouragement in the conversation. I appreciate you too, Benjamin. You're a great friend. And shout out for the super chat. Thank you for that. Dr. Bob, let's wrap it around back to you. The floor is yours. We've got to get out of here on this Friday night, Dr. Bob, but the floor is yours, my bud. Well, I did a, uh, a show recently on uh, a book entitled The Pope and the Professor on the life of uh, Dr. Ignaz von Dollinger, who uh, organized the first and second Bonn reunion conferences in the late 19th century. Um, I find the, the late 19th century to be a very fascinating period of time because it seems like it was the first period of time in a long time where people of different Christian confessions began to actually talk with one another. Um, those conferences were spurred by Vatican I and the pronouncement of papal infallibility. And so it was a meeting of Catholics who dissented from that council, the Eastern Orthodox, the Anglicans, and then there are a significant number of Reformed and Lutheran observers. And whether or not we agree ultimately at the end of the day on doctrine or what the church is, I think we have to at least show charity towards others who may name the name of Christ to at least try to work towards unity in some sense. I'm not promoting, uh, you know, sort of the modern ecumenical movement per se, um, because I believe that truth divides uh, as well as truth unites. And we have to hold fast to what we believe the scriptures to teach um, and to what we our own convictions, our own conscience uh, is. That was one of the big issues for Dollinger was uh, he was courted by the Roman Catholic Church at the end of his life to try and reconcile. But he's like, I cannot assent to that which I believe by conscience is not true. Um, but at the same time, he spent much of the rest of his life in dialogue and discussion with people from other Christian confessions. And uh, I haven't always been perfect at that, um, uh, but uh, I appreciate uh, Father Jonathan's grace and his charity. And uh, it's, it's not always a, an enviable uh, position to be sort of, uh, you know, particularly in discussions like this, you know, the, um, the antagonist, uh, so to speak. But uh, I feel that uh, we had a very good discussion tonight um, Father Jonathan is certainly somebody I want to continue talking to and uh, continue to discuss these deep and important issues with, um, because I think we should all uh, strive uh, to what our Lord uh, prayed in John chapter 17, that they may all be one. No doubt. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think we've co we covered a lot tonight. Obviously not everything, but hey, here we are around two hours Friday night. We've still got time to to have a great night though so everybody listen uh, let's just continue to grow in these matters uh church history is important and uh understanding people uh that you don't agree with is important and being able to um have good dialogues for discussion is important you know and you know father jonathan ivanoff mentioned about uh you know we've there's when you look at church history there's been uh stuff that's happened that's been violent and all kinds of stuff and that's that's true and uh i always pray christians learn from that you know the okano class had some crazy parties wrecking shop in local churches and you also have uh you know where the the lutheran reformation in germany got out of control with a peasants revolt and then the the what essentially the kind of not i don't want to i don't know if i want to say slaughter but the, the aftermath it was very violent and uh you know uh it's not like things like that aren't happening in the world for the most part by god's grace um we're not seeing them now here and and um it, it's really bad when people who call Christians uh, kill other people who call themselves Christians don't want to see that. And so dialogues are, are much, much better. And so shout out to everybody listening uh, tonight and, and who was down, uh, down to check this out. And thank you for joining us very much. Both my guests, Dr. Bob, you want to mention your YouTube channel and then Father Javin, uh, Ivanov will, will let you finish out with your details so people can find you. Dr. Bob, what can they see from you online? And this is where we'll close. 
Yeah. So um, if anybody's interested, uh, they can contact uh, either you or I, uh, probably you to get uh, my YouTube link. Uh, I have a general interest in church history, have been studying it uh, as uh, a lay person for almost 11 years now, ever since a young Roman Catholic uh, walked into my life at a, uh, a university dining hall. So I'm trying to work my way through Philip Schaff's History of the Christian Church, uh, chapter by chapter. That's a long-term goal of mine, uh, but also talk about other things relevant to, to church history. Maybe one of these days I'll start putting uh, medical stuff out there as well on my YouTube channel. Uh, I am a published author in the medical field, but uh, considering the current climate of things, uh, I, I would like to continue to maintain my low profile until I am an independent practicing physician. No doubt, no doubt. Last but not least, Father Jonathan Ivanoff, what you got going on where people can find you online? Well, Facebook is a great place to find me online uh, under my name, Jonathan Ivanoff. Uh, my parish page of St. John the Theologian Orthodox Church is also a great way to connect because um, I post a lot of um, spiritually profitable stuff there, uh, articles, videos, things like that that people might find very interesting, uh, edifying, and so forth. Um, and um, beyond that, if you connect with me uh, there, and you can IM me through Facebook and you want to ask me any questions, I can share my email then and we can take it even further. So thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, Vocab and Dr. Bob. I think this was a great evening. Hey, I agree. Thank you. I'm going to drop yeah. you guys off and talk to the audience for a second. I got an announcement to tell them. You guys have a beautiful night. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Audience, listen, I am going to be doing a debate tomorrow. Uh, on the Solo Vision Debate League, SVDL. So come check that out, SVDL. Uh, I I'm going to say 6 o'clock my time. Eight, is it 8 o'clock, I think, Eastern time? Against Imam Bashir. And we're going to be discussing, did Jesus um, survive his crucifixion? Did Jesus survive his crucifixion? Uh, the one I'm debating is an Ahmadi uh, Muslim, Ahmadi Muslim, and he believes that Jesus did survive his crucifixion and went to India. And so I'm going to do that. David Pitt says, uh, vocab going to debate Jay Dyer. I talked to Jay Dyer and, uh, briefly and did not enjoy the experience of how he was in my inbox immediately after. We could have had a different thing going on, but I'm just not that interested in it. And uh, David, it's funny. You're, you want me to debate Jay. Jay's not the gatekeeper of Eastern Orthodoxy. He, he's really not. Everybody doesn't have to talk to him or debate him, especially when he acts how he acts. I'm just not interested. So uh, why wouldn't you want me to debate a Muslim? I just I don't understand the mentality. This is what we're talking about, uh, the mentality where you're like, oh, you got to do this, you got to do that. Wouldn't you want me to to debate a Muslim? I mean, I, 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 I do not understand. And let me, let me tell you something, David. Uh, the Muslim, Imam Bashir, I spoke to him on the phone before the debate. We vehemently disagree. He was much kinder and much more of a gentleman. <laughs> and he's going to debate me. It's going to be a wild debate than Jay Dyer was. So I'm just, I don't, there's so many people in the world. Why you got to talk to guys who are like that, you know? So uh, anyways, uh, I do I do hope to see you, some of, some of the guys there. Um, there and uh, Father Jonathan Ivanoff, yeah. If you want to give your email in the live chat, you can jump in the live chat and give your email. That is totally fine, and let people get a hold of you that way. You got to do it in the live chat there. And so I hope to see you guys tomorrow, and then uh, Sunday night. I'm working on a debate, but if it doesn't happen, then what I'm going to be doing instead is uh, probably a smoke room on my own channel as well. So, anyways, a lot of stuff popping off with that. I hope to see you guys around, and this is going to be coming out. And it's going to be available here. So don't forget that. All right, y'all. God bless. Peace out. Shalom. Again, thank you very much to the guests. Come back next time.